Hello and welcome to this webinar on error handling. This is part two of a series on error handling. In part one, we went over these things that you see here. We went over colon trap and uh, colon colon uh, for setting up traps in transfers and defense, um, error numbers and error messages. You can see the previous webinar on dialog.tv. Now, if you're particip participating live today, uh, there should be a chat functionality. Uh, we are currently having some technical problems with that. I'll let you know if it is in order later and you could then refresh your page and participate in chat. So an overview of what we're going to look at today. There is a quad trap that I'll go over today. And even though it's n really called trap event, we're going to call it trap error because we're not dealing with general events, just errors. General events will be in a future webinar. And then there is quad DMX, which is um, a container for a lot of information about the latest error that happened. Before we go into the details, let's look at why um, what we learned in the previous webinar might not be sufficient for some advanced cases. So here is an example. Let's say you are working on some code and it hits an error. Then if you check what the current stack indicator is, you will see that the function that had the error is suspended on the stack. If you run the function again to see if you're, you're fixed to the code, indeed solve the problem, and you hit another error, then that gives you an additional suspension on the stack. Now, some people don't like this mode of working. Of course, if you can fix the problem while your function is suspended and then continue, that's fine. But some like to just um, go back to a clean slate and then run everything from the beginning. And we're going to look at how you can establish such a, um, such a setup so you can work like that. Another thing we're going to look at today is if you have a large application, let's say it calls some utility function inside a, a global trap that it has said. And that utility function accesses some data. Now there is a fault in the data which causes an error in the sub function. Execution is then transferred back to the trap in the main function and it hands off to an error reporting tool that say sends an email to you as the developer or stores their some debugging information somewhere. That reporting tool has access to the last expression that was executed that caused the error. But because we have moved away from the scope in which the error happened, then the actual cause of the error, which was the faulty data, is invisible to the error reporting tool. We have left the sub-function and we are now operating from within the main function. We've been calling something from the main function. And in order to deal with that, we have quattrap. Quattrap is a variable you can set it to a definition for an error handler or for multiple handlers and even though it really nominally is a vector of error handler setups then we are lenient and you can set it to just a single error handler without having to enclose it or even revel and enclose it so because of that we're just going to look at a single handler, but of course this applies to any number of handlers. An error handler consists of one or more error numbers, those we dealt with in the previous webinar. Then comes an action, and finally some code. 
and there are also cases where you don't have any code. The actions consist of single letters. It can be an E for execute over there where the error happened. It could be a C for cut back the stack to the trap definition, the place where the where quad trap has been set, and then execute the code. We can also skip to the next error handler in quad trap with n, or stop looking in this list of uh, of error traps altogether, which means that the error will either have to be handled by any higher level error trap, say with quad trap or colon trap, or if nothing handles the error, then we'll drop back to the default action when an error happens, which is to print the error message into the session. We're going to focus mainly on the E, execute there. Um, the next and stop functionality are really mostly ob obsolete when in we in light of colon trap and the colon colon but there are some things you cannot do with those here is a function we've taken from the previous webinar and we've set it up to catch error 11 which is a domain error when that error happens we're going to run this code notice this is a character vector that has two statements inside. So it's equivalent to these two lines of code. When an error happens, we're going to check the local quad trap. And if division here gives a domain error, then it matches this handler. And then we see we have to execute something, which is that code. So we execute these two statements, the second of which is um, a go to down to the label and we continue. Notice that in the code that we executed as part of the trap we are assigning to z which is the result variable of foo and because it appears in the header then it's local here so even though there's an execution here going on that's kind of outside of this function um, we're still dealing with a localized name here so there's no leaking out the, this assignment to outside the function. And that, of course, becomes the result uh, eventually after some modification. Now, if we run the function with one as an argument, which is a valid right argument for the division, then we got the normal result. And if we run it with zero, which causes a domain error in the division, then the error trap kicks in and the flow goes through the error trap, running these two statements, continuing down with the end label and done. You can also use this straight in the session to modify the behavior when an error happens. Here we're setting a handler for a length error. We're going to execute the statement which is just quote silly quote but we have to double all the quotes because they appear inside a character vector. Now if you cause a domain error to happen normal action is taken. But if we cause a length error, then we get the message back. Notice here that the word silly is not the result of plus. We didn't modify how plus behaves when it hits an error. We're simply stopping that and printing this message to the session. So you cannot capture this as a result. When you've set the quad trap to this handler, then s the, n the value of quad trap is immediately normalized. So it might come as a surprise that if you look at the shape of quad trap after setting it, it has only one element, even though we gave it three. Now, there's this really useful tool called RevObj, but it's a little bit hard to find it. Um, in fact, it's so useful that in version 18.1, that's due this summer, we're adding a user command to allow you easy access to it. Now, if we run this on Quadtrap, we can see that the value of Quadtrap has been normalized. It became a vector of a single handler, 
and the list of error numbers that this handler is valid for has been normalized. We only really gave it a scalar, but it was normalized to a one element vector. When you've set it like this for trying it out, you probably want to reset it back to a, a default value, which is empty. But if you try to assign, say, an empty numeric vector to Quattrap, well, you get that same message back. And that is because Quattrap must be set to uh, zero or more handlers. And handl a handler has to be one of these three or two element vectors. So because it doesn't have the right length, then uh, we got a length error, which was handled by the trap. Instead, what you can do is take the current value of trap, which has been normalized, and reshape it to a length zero. Now, if we try to look at what its value is, we can see that we still have a normalized uh, vector of handlers. And the prototypical element was derived from the single element we had there before. So the number five was replaced with a zero and the E was replaced with a space and the expression was replaced with a bunch of spaces. But it doesn't matter, it's an empty vector of potential handlers, has the right format. A shorter way to write this is to do an in-place change of quad trap to change it to length zero. Now this definition only handles domain errors. So if we try to give a two element vector, then we still go back to the normal behavior. I've just been told that uh, the chat is now active. Uh, you may need to reload the page. So if you're watching this live, reload the page and you should be able to use the chat to ask questions that I'll try to answer here. Now let's amend our function. Instead of having a single error number, we're having two error numbers, one for domain and one for length error. And now when we run it with a two element vector and we get a length error, we go through the error handling. And when we run it with a zero, which is a domain error, we also go through the error handling. Of course, as we learned in the previous webinar, we can also set the error number just to zero, which is a special value that means all no all numbers for all errors. We can have multiple handlers. So here we have two expressions that we want to run. One is B and one is C. If we hit an error 11, we're running B. If we ha hit an error 5, we're running C. And we can also have a fallback. So the specific errors 11 and 5 have their own expressions, and all other errors are being handled by expression D. And this is similar to what we saw with colon trap, where we can have case statements and then an else. Now let's put this into action for our use case, for the large application, where our problem was that once we've dropped from the sub function into the main function, then the scope where the error happened, and thus the data that caused the error are invisible to the error report. So we're going to switch from using colon trap to use quad trap. And the expression we want to run is a call to that reporting function with an argument consisting of a vector of pairs of names. So quad and negative two gives us all the variables that are currently visible. And for each name, we pair up that name with its value. So now the error report can get that information because this expression was executed over there where the error happened. We transfer and control to the error report. It has an argument consisting of all those values and names, and it can include that in its report. So the way it would look is we're assigning quadtrap like this. But there's actually more we want, might want to include. It's very good to have all these names and values. But we might also know, want to know what error happened. And so we have the error number that we learned about in the previous webinar. 
but there are a lot of a lot more details to the error that could be included in the report as well. And this brings us to Quad DMX. So this is the extended diagnostic message. It contains a lot of information about the last error that happened, not just its type. Let's start off with a clear workspace. If you want to look at what Quad DMX is, you'll find it's a bit special. The shape is empty, so that's a scalar, and the depth is zero, so it's a simple scalar. But if you try to just do Quad DMX, nothing at all prints, not even an, an empty line. By jumping through a little bit of a hoop, we can find out that Quad DMX returns a namespace. And if an error has happened, then it looks very different when you just execute Quad DMX. It may look very intricate, but if you look into it, the namespace that Quad DMX returns has a lot of members. And if you create a 2x2 two two matrix consisting of the names and values of the EM and the message variable inside that namespace, then we get the exact look of the display form of Quad DMX. So whenever an error happens, Quad DMX uh, returns a namespace that contains information about that error and sets its display form to give you a brief overview of what happened. A nice trick to easily look at all the things that we have in Quad DMX is to convert it to JSON. This is just the beginning. There are actually a lot more. In here, we can see the DM member, and that's the basic part of that normal message we get printed into the session. And there are a few more details as well, including, as you can see, a help URL, which is really a, a leftover from when we first added Quad DMX to the language. We thought about having a web page for every specific error that could happen, but that kind of fizzled out. In a upcoming webinar, we'll have a look at how you can use this in your application so that you can give a, a user a place where to go to find out information about whatever error happened. Now we can use this to piece together a custom error message. So inside Quad DMX's namespace, we have these various members and we can take pieces out of them and stick them together to form a different type of error message than what we have in APL by default. The way you can easily set this up is by using this trick with assignment and using quote quad. So immediately as you enter this expression into APL, it will ask you for a value for quote quad. And then you can enter this expression. You might want to do this because entering Ent uh, writing a character vector that contains the expression that itself has quotes in it can be kind of hairy with doubling all the quotes as necessary. Okay, continuing, now that we hit an error, we can see that the default display of an error that happens in APL has been replaced by our custom message. So if you want to have a custom look to your system, you can set it up like this. When you've played with that, you want to reset Quad Trap. And then any error just gives the normal message. Some errors have rather intricate error displays. So, for example, if you try to access a file that's not there, you'll have an error message coming back consisting both of the basic error type um, and a specialized message for what happened and a message from the operating system when it uh, got back to APL saying we can't deliver this file. And piecing together all of that into some kind of um, consistently looking thing like the default look, it can be complicated. But AppleCart to the rescue. In fact, AppleCart is also really useful. And in version 18.1 this summer, we're adding an AppleCart user command. So you don't even have to move to your browser to look things up. But for now, let's go to AppleCart. 
and we enter DMX. And the next entry here, you can see that is a long complicated expression to piece together conditionally on which information is there and which isn't. Something that looks exactly like what you would get printed into the APS session on an error. So we copy this and create a function, an error handling function, paste this long awkward expression in, and that takes care of printing to session our um, message. Now we're just missing the expression that went wrong and that caret at the bottom. So we drop the first line of dm, which would be the message, and then stack those the remaining two lines on top of each other. You set up the error trap so that when any error happens whatsoever, we call our error handler. And now we can see that we have achieved nothing. Right? The display when an error happens looks exactly like it would if we hadn't set up this error handler. So what's this good for? Remember that use case we talked about? You had an erroring function. Once you run it, you build up a stack. And when you run it again, your stack grows. Now remember back to the different types of handlers we could set. This was executing over there. But we can also ask that the stack be cut back first. That's what exactly what we need here. So we're changing the E to a C, clear the stack, run our erroring function, and we can see that the stack hasn't grown. We, of course, you can then customize this to get exactly the type of error behavior that you want, with or without leaving the stack. And that's what I wanted to go through today. Here's an overview of it. You can find out how to construct the error messages on Apple Cart. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in chat right now. But remember that you can always get the full information about things like Quadtrap and Quaddmx by simply typing them into your APL session and pressing F1. While I'm waiting to hear if there are any questions, uh, here is an overview of upcoming webinars, both dialogues and uh, those arranged by the British APL Association. You can see the details on their website. Right. Um, let's see any questions coming in. So Devin is asking um, if you are creating your own DMX value, then uh, there are many things that you can't assign and whether this can be changed. Um, there's no way to programmatically change what you can set or not. I will, in a future error, um, error handling webinar, go into how you create your own errors and populate Quad DMX, and I will speak about those things there. Uh, but if you think that there are properties that you should be able to assign to, but you currently can't, then I suggest writing an email to support at dialogue.com and explain what it is you want to do. And we may consider um, allowing more things to be set. Okay, that's all for today. If everything goes right, then I 
we'll be back on June 10 with the third part of the series on air handling. Thank you so much for watching.